Welcome back to What You Need to Know with Mark Auer. And today is April 12, 2019, and we're going to have a discussion that surrounds both uh, our conversation of two weeks ago uh, regarding uh, a suicide, apparent suicide, if you will. It was in uh, uh, CNN by Holly Yen on March 25th. And we're also going to discuss the two boys that this week allegedly beat his mother with a bat, bludgeoned her after robbing her. That was an Apple News push yesterday, April 11th, uh, from Fox News. So, but let's begin today with prayer and set the tone for the discussion. Because we are not in judgment of these individuals, and I want to profess that as well as pray that. So, first reading is James chapter 4, verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. And I pray to you, Heavenly Father, for you are love, you are empathy, and you love these individuals. You love them and you want them to come home to you. And we are going to speak about the underpinnings and the the empathy and the la- and the apathy in either of the in- instances. Our second reading today is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. So April 12th, today, 2019, Apple News had a push uh, yesterday, April 11th, from Fox News. It reads, Texas teen beat his mother with baseball bat, slit her throat with friends' help police say. Two Texas teenagers are facing capital murder murder charges Thursday after allegedly killing one of their mothers by beating her with a baseball bat and slitting her throat, all because she witnessed them burglarizing her home. Investigators say they were armed with a gun, entered the property with a key, and started gathering items they were going to take from the home. But when the mother returned home, walked in, and turned on the lights, Uh, They say one of the individuals, I guess her son, started bludgeoning her from behind with a baseball bat. And then the other joined in the attack shortly thereafter. And then they wrapped her in a blanket and duct taped her body. And unfortunately, his sister came home and found her. So why am I talking about this? Well, I'm also going to talk shortly about the empathy of the father that we discussed two weeks ago the father of the young six-year-old who was killed in the Sandy Hook shootings. He was a neuroscientist, and he, you know, was tormented by the fact that his daughter was one of the 20 children and six adults killed in the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. So he was tormented. He had empathy, and these two boys had apathy. And how does that relate to us as human beings? So we're going to go to Martha Stout. She's going to speak to the matter. Uh, The Sociopath Next Door by Martha Stout, page 130. And uh, we're going to read a little bit of her work uh, to help drill into how someone could be so apathetic and disconnected that they could bludgeon their own mother with a baseball bat. So still searching, she says on page 130, still searching for environmental influences on the development of sociopathy, many investigators have turned to the concept of attachment disorder rather than childhood abuse per se. Normal attachment is an innate system in the brain that motivates an infant to seek the nearness of their parent or whatever caregiver is available so that the very first interpersonal relationship can be form, love, love and empathy. This first relationship is crucial not only for reasons of infant survival, she states, but also because it allows the infant's immature limbic system to use the mature functions of the adult's brain to organize itself. And here's the most important part. When a parent reacts empathetically to an infant, the child's positive emotions, such as contentment and elation, are encouraged 
and I'm going to inter interject, formed, okay, we're talking about brain process. She continues, the child's positive emotions such as contentment and elation are encouraged and their potential and their potentially overwhelming negative emotions such as frustration and fear can be moderated. This attack, or this arrangement, she continues, promotes a sense of order and safety that will eventually be encoded in the baby's own memory, providing them with a portable version of what John Bowlby referred to in Attachment and Loss as a secure base in the world. And that's incredibly important. Secure base in the world. Research tells us that adequate attachment in infancy has many happy outcomes, including the healthy development of emotional self-regulation, autobiographical memory, and the capacity to reflect on one's own experiences and actions. And she continues, and this is probably the point that I'm striving to make, perhaps most important, attachment in infancy allows the individual to create affectional, affectionate bonds with other people later on. The earliest attachments are formed by seven months of age and most human infants succeed in becoming attached to a first caregiver in a way that develops these important capabilities. And she goes on to say, attachment disorder is a tragic condition that occurs when attachment in infancy is disrupted because of parental incompetence, in parens, as in serious emotional disorder on the part of the parent, end of parens, or because the infant is simply left too much alone, as in an old-fashioned orphanage, she says in parens. And I'm going someplace, so just bear with me. She continues to say, children and adults with severe attachment disorder for whom attachment was not possible during the first seven months of life are unable to bond to others emotionally. Okay, and this is what the foundation of psychopathy we're talking about here. And are thereby directed to a fate that is arguably worse than death. So if we, and, and this is obviously going to be difficult for some people to hear, but if in the uh, American dream, we are provisioning a outcome for our children, provisioning a better level of uh, uh, life and uh let's say, comfort than we ourselves had. And so we uh, maybe create a dual income household or we're a single parent struggling to provide and we leverage a caregiver as, and I'm not in judgment of anybody here, my wife and I did. We were both working and both of our children at a very early age were uh, uh, cared for by, uh, thank God, a loving and caring and nurturing environment other than our own home. Okay, so thank you, Jesus. How and However, if in our way of life, we're allowing for others who may not have the same values and same thoughts and same feelings and same emotion and same level of love that we have, God willing, and our children are raised in an environment that's mm, sterile, apathetic, uh, not nurturing, not relational, not, you know, embracing and loving and cuddling and holding and encouraging and you get the picture. Then it's possible that we are indeed as a nation and as a world chasing the almighty dollar no judgment there, but, you know, everybody does. So we are, and in the ignorance, creating the very environment that opens up the door for an attachment disorder, like we're discussing in these two individuals. You know, you got, I don't know what happened to the boy and, and between him and his mom, and I'm certainly not judging, but there has to be some kind of attachment disorder that would enable them to bludgeon her with a baseball bat from the back of the head. Here and again, no judgment, just talking, you know, openly and honestly that that's a problem, okay? Criminally speaking and also in the development of the relationship. So we'll go into the financial ramifications of our behaviors and, and, and our reality in another episode. So you get it. Latchkey kids, strangers raising our children, dual income households, chasing the almighty dollar. No judgment. My wife and I have done that as well. It's a problem. 
And just to reflect American Indian customs, the mother wouldn't allow a stranger even near her child for 30 days. Minimally, they would uh, sequester themselves in a tent and she would nurture and cuddle and, you know, create that bond that was absolutely necessary for the young child's development as a, a tribe member that was functioning, empathetic and grounded to say the least. So let's read uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders definition for reactive attachment disorder of infancy or early childhood. It's page 118 in the DSM-4, and it's referenced under 313.89. A. Markedly disturbed and developmentally inappropriate social relatedness in most contexts beginning before age five years as evidenced by either one or two. One is persistent failure to initiate or respond in a developmentally appropriate fashion to most social interactions as manifest by excessively inhibited, hypervigilant, or highly ambivalent or contradictory Contradictory responses. And in Perrin's example, an example given, the child may respond to caregivers with a mixture of approach, avoidance, and resistance to comforting, or may exhibit frozen watchfulness. So the child doesn't trust the caregiver. I'm interjecting. The second is diffuse attachments as manifest by indiscriminate sociability with marked inability to exhibit appropriate selective attachments. Example given in this, excessive familiarity with relative strangers or lack of se- selectivity in a choice of attachment figure. So in, and I'm not reading this now, I'm just going to try to help break it down. So one is the kid doesn't trust the stairs frozen watchfulness, avoids being touched, doesn't like to be approached, doesn't like to be interacted with. And to be honest with you, and I'm also going to interject the personal experience. I'm driving my daughter to school today, and she asked me not to talk. To me. Just don't talk to me. I'm like, what? You know, so, and in that, you know, I, and in developing this, this, uh, this episode, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I nurtured and cuddled my son a lot more than my daughter. It's a shame in early childhood development. And uh, I also, uh, but I also look at the situation in not a condemning way. I thought, you know, God, our father, how many times have we turned our backs on him? How many times have we told God not now? How many times have we said, God, I don't need you. Stop talking to me. And then God, how does God respond? He loves us. He provides everything we need to be able to live and maybe come home to him at a future point when we realize we're screw-ups and we need to get ourselves into a situation where we're backed into a wall and then we reach out. I need you! And then going back to the lesson here, the second is diffuse attachments. Okay, so what does what, what the second uh, definition mean? Well, basically anybody that comes into our life will attach to, you know, in hopes to replace the uh, the missing uh, most important uh, relationship. So if sociopathy is the lack of empathy and attachments and bonds that cause us to have a lack of empathy, to refrain from harming others or using others, what do we got here? What's going on? Well, here's the perspective, you know, as I see it in the commercial scheme. We don't need God we don't want God and God isn't anything that's relevant to and this is you know just cold callous the commercial scheme the mechanisms if you will of uh, you know the commercial scheme so we don't need God we don't want God and God is you know uh, outdated and not relevant however God is love so if we're supposed to take care of family and others and love and we don't have love and we don't have empathy what do we got Oh, you got a bunch of people that'll do unto others as they choose to do unto others before it's done unto them, right? Get yours while you can. There's no love in that. Use others before you get used, right? 
So why is that important? Because that's the enemy himself causing you to feel entitled to use, abuse, and you know, rob your own mom and beat her in the back of the head with a baseball bat. I mean, you know, that's a total lack of empathy and attachment. And I, maybe there's a little judgment there, so forgive me, Father. But what I'm trying to say is we need God, we need love, and we need God, you know, his way of teaching us how to raise our children. So here are 12 principles of child rearing. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's Proverbs 22, verse 6. The Hebrew means from infancy to adolescence, while training carries the connotation of narrowing or hedging in. Training a child means appropriate instruction according to the age of the child, and it begins in infancy reading something that is online at vision.org. God bless you. Vision.org. It's a November 23rd, 2009 article about family and relationships and it's 12 scriptural principles of child rearing. I just read the first one. Begin early. The second, present a united front. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14.33 Parents should agree on the methods and practices they will use in training their children. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Three, love your child. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. That's 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And as God loves us in our less than perfect human state, so our love for our children should not be contingent on perfect performance. Amen. Amen. So shall it be. Four, discipline your child. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That's who Hebrews 12, 6. Discipline is the reinforcement of instruction and is applied with love. Five, have your emotions under control when instructing children. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. It's Proverbs 16, verse 32. The way we respond to our children teaches them how to deal with situations in their own lives. Oh, what are we doing there? We're modeling behavior for our children to model later on for their children. Christ Jesus, we love you because you are perfect. I wish we'd all model your love. Six, be consistent. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews 13.8. Consistency allows the child to develop trust and confidence in you and your instruction. Okay, so that's incredibly important. The child trusts you, okay? How can a child trust anybody if they can't trust you, your their parent? Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 7. Never underestimate the importance of attitude. For the Lord does not see a man as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Forced compliance does not produce qualities of character any more than does permissiveness. Character is what we are on the inside, the heart. 8. Give your child the gift of emotional maturity. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Life situations are best handled by clear thinking as opposed to emotional reactions. 9. Don't allow your home to be child-centered. And I'm guilty of that. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God, 1 Corinthians 11.3. Children should fit into the family structure and learn to contribute to it. My Lord, I am so guilty of doing everything for them. Forgive me, and I hope that they'll uh, be stronger than me. 10. Be what you want your child to become. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Parental example speaks louder than words. 
11. Set high moral standards. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9. Don't be afraid to raise the bar of acceptable behavior and challenge your children to reach for it. They can jump higher than most parents' expectations. And then 12, and finally, realize that true character is formed by godly morality. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 7. Relative morality produces only relative character. So these are again uh, quoted from vision.org. The scripture quotations it, it reads at the bottom are from the New King James Version, copyright 1988 by Thomas Nelson, Inc., unless otherwise noted, used by permission, all rights reserved. So I'm quoting this and I'm reading it on your behalf. Uh, It's a November 23rd, 2009, Family and Relationships, 12 Scriptural Principles of Child Rearing. So I'm out of time and I appreciate you spending it with me. We're going to end. So an older guy, that's a April 9th, 2019 news push, went back to their house and tried to break in. It's about an Uber driver. Remember, the time that you spend with your child, don't always think about the future like oh i've got to work and do all this now and then later on they'll benefit and and then you know trade off and i'm guilty of it definitely guilty of it the time in the present is most important and i'm sure there's children out there that will say yep so right now we're going to pray for the single parents out there that struggle torn between working and providing financially and being there with their children we're going to pray for marriage Not because it's the Christian thing to do, but it's the right thing to do by your children. Giving them the perspectives of two human beings that God puts together to enable that child to have a better understanding of what love is. That's it. I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. I just want you to have an easier time of it and not stress. And if the child is kind of being raised by somebody else who is callous and apathetic uh, we're trying to identify that that's a problem and uh, we don't we don't want that child to suffer you know with any attachment disorders and not trust and then maybe later on make decisions that are counterintuitive to love and lawfulness to say the least so heavenly father we pray today for those individuals who are single parents may they love nurture hold coddle stroke acknowledge and be with their children opening up an opportunity for their child their child to feel acknowledged loved part of a greater plan which is your plan to perpetuate love and perpetuate empathy and perpetuate taking care of those who are incapable of taking care of themselves We ask these things in Jesus' name, for you are the source of all love, all goodness, all care, all empathy, all understanding, and all life. Amen.